Glory to. Three, two, two. All right. <laughs> I need the area. Three, two, two. I need the area. Let's sing the first and the last verse. morning once more. I have my friends with me here. Right over there, the tallest guy <laughs> is Edwin. Then uh, we have Albert. Then uh, we have Lillian. Uh, we have Charles and myself, Kenji. We have our little baby, baby running with their the nursery. And uh, there is Isabel who could not make it today. She traveled uh, to uh, Minnesota. So we call ourselves the Bay Voices. Actually, we used to know each other while we're in Cameroon, while attending college. So coincidentally, we found ourselves in the Bay Area. And we decided that, oh, let's come together and sing, you know, for the glory of God. So this is actually our second outing. We're at the Presbyterian Church in Hayward about uh, two months ago. So the first song we are going to sing comes from uh, Romans 12, verse 5. I didn't have it on the screen, but I'm just going to read it. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. Though we are many, we are one body, we are one body in Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, we are one body in Christ. Though we are many, we are one body. We are one body in Christ. Though we are many, are many, we are one body. We are one body in Christ. Zumbe, zumbe, zum. Zumbe, zumbe, zum. Day that the Lord has made. Zumbe, zumbe, zumbe. 
Good morning and welcome to worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church. My name is Kurt Heineman. I'm one of the pastors here and a welcome to you all this morning. Today is a family worship service, which means that we are all gathered together, all the generations in this sanctuary together for worship. So children are invited to stay throughout the whole worship service in this space. And I thought I'd let you know that in the pews in front of you, there is something called the Family Guide to Worship. So if you long to learn more about what it is that we're doing in the context of our sanctuary today, this is a great guide for us. There's also space back here for the children if they feel like they would like to read some books later on during the sermon. There's a little book nook back there, and they can do that. But we also invite you just to be present with your families today, too, and to worship with them and sing with them. So welcome. Welcome to worship this day. Everybody is welcome here. And I'm thinking how amazing it is when I met Kenji just a couple of years ago and we had coffee together and and he has become such an integral part of the community. So thank you and thank you all for being here with us today. And will you all rise now for the singing of our next song? Let's worship together. I was listening to a good friend of mine who is friends with a rabbi, and this rabbi was telling him this interesting story about the first sentence in the Hebrew Scriptures, the first sentence of the Bible, which is that when God created the heavens and the earth, and he tells the story that in Hebrew there's this little word, it's et, et, uh, that does not get translated into the English language, but this rabbi would say that before God created the heavens and the earth, God created et. And et is this Hebrew word that shows the relationship between the subject and the object. So perhaps God created relationship before he even created heavens and the earth. And so when it comes to a time of a prayer of confession, sin is really 
the breaking of those relationships between heaven and earth, brothers and sisters, friends, family, that's sin. Those actions that break those relationships that God called good. So as we enter into a time of prayer of confession, let's confess all the ways that we have broken these relationships. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come before you trusting that all other ground is sinking sand and that in you, Lord, is goodness, is grace and mercy and that, Lord, you have declared so many of the things that you have made to be good, our relationships with one another, our relationships with you, our relationship with creation. And yet sometimes our activities as humans would show the otherwise, that we hurt one another, that we cause pain and division amongst one another, that we destroy the earth that you have so beautifully made, God, that your life force emanates through all of creation, and yet we seek to gain from it for ourselves, but not to appreciate it for all that you have made it to be. So, Lord, we take a moment in silent prayer to confess to you all the ways that maybe we have broken relationship from all the goodness that you have intended for us. Gracious God, we ask that you would hear these prayers of confession, that we would not be bound to our sin, but we would be able to live free into the grace that you would have for us, God. So Lord, live in us, live amongst us, and come alongside us, God, showing us a way of life that would reflect the goodness and the beauty that was there in Genesis 1. Hear these prayers of confession. Move us to grace and to love and to truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear the good news from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Jesus Christ died for us. Friends, Christ died for us, not against us. In Christ, we have grace and forgiveness. I invite you to remain seated now as Kenji and his group will sing the next song for us. May it be a reflection upon the grace that we have. Amazing grace, amazing grace. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. 
Peace of Christ be with you. At Trinity, we like to pass the peace of Christ with those around us, so I invited Sam to help me out with this. If you haven't done this before in our context, we like to pass the peace by way of handshake, right? Say, peace of Christ be with you. And how about peace of Christ be with you? Maybe a high five. Yeah, you can also do it that way. Me and my dad do. Oh, yeah. That's right. You could also create a secret handshake in the next 10 seconds with those around you, okay? So peace of Christ be with you. Let's pass the peace of Christ or with those around us. All right, children are invited to come down for the children's message. Children are invited to come down for the children's message. Children can come on down. Good morning, Jonathan. Children can come on down. Children, children, children everywhere can come on down for the children's message. Any other kids? All right. So, children, I have a couple of friends, a couple of your friends here to help with the children's message this morning. This is Kirsten and Liz, and they'll be leading the children's message this morning. Hey, guys. So, Pastor Kurt today is going to be talking in his sermon about how God gives us different clothes to prepare us to be out in the world as Christians. So Liz and I brought some of her clothes that she wears, and we're going to see what they prepare her for, hopefully. All right. Liz, what's, the, what's this? There's a helmet. And, and when do we wear a helmet? To bikes and helmets. For bikes and helmets? Yeah. And what does a helmet do? It keeps people safe. That's right. So we wear helmets when we ride bikes to keep us safe, right? Now, you guys, how do you feel when you wear a helmet? Safe, that's a good answer. Comfortable, that's good, that's a good helmet, right? Dorky sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you gotta wear clothes that don't look great, but keep you safe anyway. All right, what's next? 
That's PJs for going night night. That's right. We wear PJs for going night night, right? How do you feel in your PJs, you guys? Warm. Hot. <laughs> These are fleece PJs, yeah. Too hot sometimes. Maybe comfortable. Too hot, mostly too hot. You go to sleep, that's right. That's right. Oh, you take it off? Well, that's good. You've got control over that. All right, last one here. Liz, what's what's this one? A uh, jacket for rain. A jacket for the rain. That's right. How do you guys feel when you wear rain jackets? Cold. It's probably cold outside. Hopefully dry. It's for walking outside when it's raining, right? Yeah, that's right. Huh? You don't use those? You just get wet? That's fine, too. Maybe if you wanted to stay dry, you could get a rain jacket if you wanted. And then sometimes we have our favorite clothes that we like to wear. So Liz, what? She's, Liz is wearing her favorite clothes right now. Can you stand up? Ooh. What dress are you wearing today, Liz? Elsa. Yeah, an Elsa dress. You want to do a twirl for us? That's right. So when we wear our favorite clothes, how do you guys feel when you wear your favorite outfit? Good. Energetic, mm-hmm. Sometimes I feel extra confident. Like, I, yeah, confident or brave, yeah. So the clothes that God gives us to go out into the world feel a lot like that. They're kind of pretend clothes. They're not real. But it helps us to feel confident and brave going out and being good Christians in the world. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right, let's say a quick prayer. You guys can repeat after me. Dear God, Thank you for giving us what we need to go out into the world and to be your people. Amen. All right, you guys can get your worship packets and then go back to sit with your families. We are continuing this worship series on the first letter to the Thessalonians, written by Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And in the context of the readings that I'm going to read for us today in chapter 4 and in chapter 5, a lot of commentators think that this is the particular concerns and the reasons why Paul was writing this letter. That a lot of what came before and what comes at the end is, is sort of on the outlier, but this is the really crux. This is the reason why Paul is writing this letter to the Thessalonians, some deep concerns in that community. And so if you'd like to follow along in the few Bibles in front of you, you can do that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, through chapter 5, verse 11. Or you can follow along on the screen in front of you. Listen to God's word. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, You do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, 
then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in the darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or are asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. This is the gift of God's word. Let's pray together. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think one of the difficulties of trying to interpret and understand a letter that's written is that we only have sort of one side of the story when it comes to a letter being written. If I were to interpret or to intercept a letter that's written by you to you, you only have sort of one side of the story of what's being taken place. And yet you can tell that there's such love and concern and sort of pastoral wisdom that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy want to share with the people in Thessalonica. You can just tell there's something going on in that community, some kind of deep concern that's taking place. And they really want them to know What's going to happen in the end? Paul is addressing some kind of deep concern in Thessalonica. And we don't know exactly what the concern is, but we know it has to do with, with what happens with those of us in our community who die. What happens with those of us in our community who perhaps were there for the beginning of Paul's missionary journeys and heard the good news and have died since they heard the good news? What happens with them? What happens with us when Jesus returns? If part of the gospel message is this idea that Jesus is going to come again, what does this mean for those in our community who have died? Um, is there hope? Is there hope for them? Is there hope for persons who didn't hear this message beforehand? Is there hope for us? What does it look like to grieve the loss of others? Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, and to grieve as if you have no hope because you do have hope. But he doesn't say not to grieve. So there's so much concern in this text, and you can just tell the, the pastoral heart of the Apostle Paul is coming out. He, he wants to comfort the brothers and the sisters in Thessalonica. He wants to let them know that in their concerns, God will address them in their concerns. And in the pastoral wisdom that he shares, he offers Two things, at least. More than two things, but two things that seem to pop out to me as I read this text. One is that with Jesus' return, there is profound hope in Jesus' return for both the dead and for the living, and that we will somehow be united in that return. That there won't be a separation or a distinction for those who have died before us and those who are alive now that there's hope to be reunited with loved ones, with people in the community. And as much as the Apostle Paul wants us to be not uninformed, but to be informed about that time, he also says that the times and the seasons when the end comes, we have no idea. We have no idea about when the times and the season comes. And I had to chuckle this week as I was reading this scripture because he uses a metaphor about not knowing when the end is coming, to relate it to when a woman who is pregnant goes into her labor pains. And I had to laugh because it was exactly one year ago today that I woke up in the middle of the night and I found my wife in labor. <laughs> and I had to send a text message to Ian Hamilton at 3 a.m. and say, I'm not coming to church today. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> See what happens. Have fun. And so you did a year ago. 
So Paul offers these two things. He says there's hope. There's real hope in Jesus' return. And we don't know the times, though. We do not know the times. God is the one who knows the time and the seasons. God is the architect of these things. God is the architect of these things. And I think the concerns that he's addressing there, though we don't fully know all the concerns of that community, there's similar kinds of concerns in our lives as well about these questions around where is hope for the dead, for the living, for my life? What does hope look like in these kinds of questions and concerns? There's a very popular Christian author by the name of Rachel Held Evans. I don't know if that's a familiar name to those of us in this sanctuary or in this room. Um, she kind of became known as the, the author of the millennial Christians. And she grew up in the South in an evangelical congregation. And later on in her teenage years, in her early 20s, she left the church. And though she had this vibrant faith with Jesus and a vibrant faith with God, she just found this growing disconnect between what she was experiencing in her relationship with God and with organized religion and wondered about where is my place of belonging in the midst of this relationship I have with God. She just did not feel like she belonged in a church. And she had this growing angst. And so for the early 2000s and the last 10 years or so, she wrestled with this question. And she wrote this great book called Searching for Sunday in 2015. And to some extent, this was like the book that um, you'll see. I'm going to read a few sentences from it. And it just spoke to the angst and to the concerns of Christians who were millennials to some extent. So I want to read a few of these sentences that she wrote in this book. This is what she kept trying to tell other people as they tried to learn about what millennials wanted in a church. And she said this. She said, I told them we're tired of the culture wars, tired of Christianity getting entangled with party politics and power. Millennials want to be known by what we're for, I said, not just what we're against. We don't want to choose between science and religion or between our intellectual integrity and our faith. Instead, we long for our churches to be safe places to doubt, to ask questions, and to tell the truth, even when it's uncomfortable. We want to talk about the tough stuff, biblical interpretation, religious pluralism, sexuality, racial reconciliation, and social justice, but without predetermined conclusions or simplistic answers. We want to bring our whole selves through the church doors, without leaving our hearts and minds behind, without wearing a mask. And I think this is that sentence where she said, but without predetermined conclusions or simplistic answers, they sort of endeared her to a whole generation of people. And she grew to having more than a couple hundred thousand of followers on Twitter. And a month ago, she got really sick, and she had an infection and some kind of bacterial infection. She had to go to the hospital. And when she got to the hospital, um, the doctors determined that she was also having some seizures. And so they put her in a medically induced coma. And for the next two weeks, a whole host of medical mystery was taking place with her condition. And doctors were unable to revive her and bring her out of that medically induced coma. And she died. And she was 37 years old and left behind a one-year-old, a three-year-old, and a husband. What transpired in the next five days after she died was one of the most interesting social Christian phenomena I've ever seen. I told you that she felt this sense of not really finding a space of belonging in her Christian journey, but the place where she found the most belonging was through, through a community that was cultivated digitally on Twitter. And she had these hundreds of thousands of followers. And right after she died, for five days, it was like the whole internet grieved they grieved the loss of her life. They mourned her. They quoted her words. They recalled times they prayed with her, went to conferences with her, loved with her, were there with her in her life. And yet there was also a sort of witness about hope that was taking place too. This incredible hope that they had for the life that was lived amongst them in wrestling with these questions that didn't have simplistic answers, as she says. Um, but there was a hope that was emanating from this grief that took place for five days. 
And it was like the whole world could have access to it. Uh, a hashtag started trending on Twitter, and all of these people from the outside started looking inside on this grief that was taking place, and ultimately the hope that was emanating from this really hard reality, from this really hard reality. And I think those concerns that were shared then are similar concerns that we have too. What hope is there? Where was God in that? Where was God in that? I think there's extremely good news in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 when it comes to this wrestling and it comes to this question. I'm not sure it provides for us a simple answer, but I think there's really good news in this scripture for us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. One of my professors at Princeton Seminary wrote a commentary on Thessalonians, and she always took angst with this verse and the way it was translated in the NRSV. Uh, she's one of these brilliant scholars that knows Greek in and out. And she, in her commentary, retranslated this quote to this from the Greek. She said, since we are children of the day, clothed with the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, let us be sober. Mm. What Beverly is trying to get at here is that in the NRSV, it makes it sound like when we're in these places of deep concern and mystery in our lives, that we are the ones that are supposed to put the clothes on ourselves. We're supposed to put the clothes of faith, love, and the helmet of hope onto ourselves. But she says, no, 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 no. The Greek got it totally wrong. It's because we're children of the day, God has given us this clothing. God is the one who's given us this clothing. We have not given it to ourselves. We are unable to put this on ourselves, but God has given it to us. God has clothed us with faith, love, and hope. And this, to me, is incredibly good news because I think this was the reality that was emanating on Twitter a few weeks ago. Perhaps this was the reality that was emanating amongst Timothy, Sylvanus, and Paul as they wrote the letter. This true hope that God has given us this clothing, this armor, a biking helmet is perhaps more relevant than a helmet that is used in battle to some extent. A helmet of hope God has given to us. All week long I've been trying to think about what does this mean for a seven-year-old? What does First Thessalonians 4 and 5 mean for a seven-year-old? Because it's family worship. I'm always, I always ask myself this question before family worship if I'm preaching. What does this mean if you're seven years old? What does this mean if you're seven years old? And as I was thinking about this, I was reflecting upon an article that was written by J.J. Abrams in Wired Magazine a few years ago. J.J. Abrams, if you don't know, is kind of one of the premier storytellers of our day. And he's been in charge of a bunch of different movies and TV, and right now he's in charge of the Star Wars series. And the new Star Wars movie is coming out later this year that will end the Skywalker saga. And everybody comes to him and he says, how is it going to end? Like, how will this end? Uh, who is speaking in the trailer? Like, how is the whole story going to end? And what's made him such an incredible storyteller is not always the conclusions, but that in every story he tells, there's this element of mystery that moves the narrative along, this deep mystery that's taking place, and it's moving the narrative along. And he always talks about it's the process and the journey. It's not necessarily getting to the end. And so in this article he wrote in Wired Magazine a few years ago, he talks about in the early 1990s, he was uh, playing Super Mario Brothers 2 with his best friend Greg, and he was playing on the Nintendo Entertainment System. So you'll just have to journey with me here for a moment, okay? And then we'll get somewhere together, I promise. Um, so back in the 1990s, if you're playing the Nintendo Entertainment System, and for seven-year-olds, this may not make sense to you at all, but you couldn't, you couldn't save your progress in a video game, okay? So if you wanted to play a video game, you could play it for five minutes, and that's fine, but if you really wanted to try to win the game, you had to sit there for hours upon hours upon hours. You might try to pause the game and go to sleep that night and maybe wake up and it's still there. It might not be still there, though. So, you know, a sibling may have turned the TV off or flipped the wrong switch, and it's all gone, and you have to start all over again. So JJ and his friend Greg decide to anchor down for the night and try to beat Super Mario Brothers 2, okay? 
And here they are, they're on their couch, they're playing Super Mario Brothers 2 together, and they get to World 7, Level 2, and they're trying to jump from one cloud to another cloud, and they're unsuccessful at making this jump, and they start losing all of their Mario lives, and they've already invested 10 hours into this. It was a long Saturday, okay? And here's where the story picks up. This is JJ speaking in the Wired magazine. He says, okay, okay, Greg said, his friend, picking up the phone, I'm gonna call my cousin. Oh, this was good news. As he dialed, I kept playing and kept dying. Only 10 Marios left. I heard Greg on the phone explaining our situation to his cousin. Uh-huh, okay, thanks. Greg said, and then he hung up the phone. Somebody's gonna call us back. Good, I said. I paused the game to take a deep breath, only to resume and subsequently die again. Oh, no. A few minutes later, the phone rang. <sighs> yeah, thanks for calling, Greg said in a grim voice like there was a family emergency. <laughs> he explained to the guy what was going on, and I heard Greg say, uh-huh, okay, okay, hold on. And then Greg told me, move to the right edge, then double jump, and you should get to the next cloud. Double jump, I asked? Oh, good, this was information. This was new and helpful, and hope coursed through my veins. <laughs> Thanks, okay, I tried it, and I died. Ah, oh, I did. And I died again three more times. We we're only down to two Marios left, and I was going insane. Greg reported this to the guy on the phone and then said to me, try it one more time. Sweating, shaking my head, I tried again, and I lost my penultimate Mario, and I couldn't take it anymore. And I yelled out, will you tell that guy he has no idea what he's talking about? Greg quickly covered the mouthpiece and said to me quietly, admonishingly, dude, He's seven. <laughs> and that was when I really felt it. <laughs> Cheating is humiliating. No matter what form it takes, skipping ahead, even without the help of someone in underoos, lessens the experience. It diminishes the joy. It makes the accomplishment that much duller. And perhaps that's why mystery now more than ever has special meaning, because it's the anomaly, the glaring affirmation that the age of immediacy has a meaningful downside. Mystery demands that you stop and consider, or at the very least slow down and discover. It's a challenge to get there yourself on its terms, not yours. It turns out the seven-year-old was right, his tip finally worked, and Greg and I finished the game that day. But I traded any true satisfaction for a cheat, and I can't even remember seeing the end screen. The point is, we should never underestimate the process. The experience of doing really is everything. The ending should be the end of that experience, not the experience itself. Now, I appreciate so much of what J.J. Abrams shares in this article, but perhaps I would reinterpret it so that it's not mystery itself that moves us through on its terms, not on ours, but I think it's God that moves us through in times of deep concern and mystery. When we have been clothed with faith, love, and hope in those places of mystery where we so desperately want to get to the end, we so desperately want to know how this ends, God will move us through those spaces. God will move us through those spaces with faith, love, and hope. Years ago, I was having lunch with my grandfather. I was having lunch with my grandfather before he died, and we were just having a nice conversation together over a sandwich, and he, had, um, he and I were just talking about how we knew God was at work in our life. And I asked him how he knew, and he started to tell me a story about in his early 20s when he was, uh, it was the early 1940s, and he signed up to be in the Navy, and he got shipped off to be part of a uh, he went to a base in Florida, and, and at that base in Florida, there was a couple of platoons that were there, and then each of those platoons started to get shipped out one by one to different ships and to different battles that were going on during World War II. My grandfather uh, was sent out on a ship that never saw battle, never got into, never fought in any, anything, in any conflict, but the platoons of his other friends that were there at that base did. And he said on this one day where they kind of split the rest of the people into two groups, one that went with him and one went another way, 
this other group all went to Iwo Jima, and they all died. And it was a deeply devastating moment. And I remember him and I talking about this moment, and he said, that's how I knew God was with me. But then he also said, but I always wondered, like, how was God with those people too? And how was God with the people who are on the other side as well? And somehow, even in just asking those questions together, those real questions about where is God in this, not having predetermined simple answers about this, I could feel that sense of faith, love, and hope being present right in the midst of this dialogue and this conversation with my grandfather. And friends, that's what moves us through these places of concern and mystery in our lives. Since we are children of the day, clothed with the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, let us be sober. This is the gift that God gives to us, friends. Let's pray. Gracious God, I know we have so many concerns and there's so much mystery surrounding the end. But Lord, we also know and we also trust that you are at work in our life. And not just my life, but all of our lives. And so, God, we seek you in the midst of it. We seek you in the mystery. We seek you in the concern. We long to be known by you. And we long to know you in those places of deep mystery in our lives. So, Lord, meet us, please, we ask this, and we ask that we would grow in knowledge of you and you knowing us as well. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We all rise now for the singing of our next song together. Let's worship. Sing 
seated. And just a few announcements before we receive our offering this morning. Uh, one of them is that one of our eldest members, Fran Stewart, passed away recently, and so we are grieving and mourning with her family. Uh, but there will be a celebration of life to come, and when that happens, we'll be sure to let everybody know when that takes place. Also, we still have our uh, our new our directories, our new directories are right there in the narthex. So if you haven't picked one up, make sure to get yours for your family after worship today. And then also in two weeks on Pentecost on June 9th, right afterwards, there's going to be a new members orientation. So if you're new to the congregation, you'd like to get to know the church a little bit better, Pastor Mary and I will be hosting a brunch, and we'd be delighted if you came and joined us and answer any kind of questions that you might have about what membership looks like here at Trinity. Friends, I invite you to participate in the offering of this church and the ministries of all that God is doing here through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So will the ushers please come forward for this morning's offering.
Lord, we thank you for waking us up today and putting breath in our lungs. We raise our voices in praise to you, our creator, the Lord of life. We pray that we value each day and work faithfully for your kingdom. We ask your blessing and comfort for all the soldiers and families of soldiers who have fought for our country. Our souls groan for the day when Jesus comes, our only and forever King, when we will lay down our swords once and for all. We lift up our church to you and ask your blessing and guidance. We pray that we are a light to San Carlos and the surrounding cities, pointing the way to you, Jesus. Thank you for entrusting us with this awesome responsibility. We rejoice and say hallelujah to our wonderful counselor, almighty God, the everlasting Father. And all of God's people say amen. For our last song, we'll be doing a, an African praise medley. Uh, it will just give you an idea on how we worship in Africa. It's a lot of energy. And I used to tell my friends, after a church service, it feels like you left the gym. Because uh, it's a lot of dancing and all like. So we're going to try it today with the drums. Uh, we'll sing the first half of the song. And during the second half, if you can, you can stand. These guys will come a little bit ahead and teach you just one dance move. Just with your hand. And if you can, just, just join us there.
Because we are children of the day, clothed with the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, a hope of salvation, let us be sober and let us walk with Jesus in this world. Amen? Amen. Man, go in peace, friends.